Chapter 19 Blind Man's Bluff When I think of music, I think about melody right away. Where there's music, there's melody. Can't have one without the other. I usually think of melody as a tune, something I can go about whistling. It's easy to remember, it sticks in my mind. A tune is complete in itself, it seems to have a beginning, a middle, and an end and it leaves me feeling satisfied. But I've also heard music that has no melody. It doesn't sound like it has melody, because what I hear isn't a complete tune, but rather a melody that leaves something still to be said, to be developed, like a melodic seed that has yet to develop into a big symphonic tree. Part 3. The Lost Tape I don't know why I kept doing it. Anna and Mark reminded me several times to tuck my chin. It's not helping you walk any straighter, Mark said. They were right. But for some reason, stretching out my neck felt like it would give me a better sense of direction. Our host thought something bad happened. But since I couldn't see when people are talking to me, Mark and Anna ended up explaining things for me. When we finished our breakfast, we hiked two miles to a park with a nice view. I heard a lot of footsteps, I smelled the cold air, and I rested my hand over a huge furry head. The footsteps were asking, will she ever see again? Sometimes I heard Anna say yes. Other times, she came up with different ways to say never. I picked just the right company for this trip. Anna and Mark let me walk on my own and enjoy the experiment like a truly blind person. But as we were on our way to lunch, Anna told me to stop walking and instructed me to hold out my two arms and one of my legs for a big hug, so big, it almost felt like I was hugging a wall. When we arrived at the restaurant for our free lunch, I had the opportunity to interview the owner. If I remember correctly, her name was Raquel. She said she used to be a flight attendant, as well as the co-owner of the restaurant, her husband. Or was he a pilot? He had to be elsewhere that day and couldn't join us. When I was halfway through my blank tape, Raquel started interviewing me to find out what went wrong with my eyes. We didn't give anybody heads up about it being a sightless restaurant review, so I told her it was an experiment on blindfold tourism. She was very kind. She let me hold my fork and knife only after she had cut my meal into bite-sized pieces. But that made me miss the fun of slicing meat while blind. The table sounded full with food. I heard Mark and Anna remark on the feast they were seeing. But something else was getting full. So I had to excuse myself and ask Raquel if she could call Anna for me. That's the sink. Anna gingerly moved my wrist to touch the sink. That's the flush. And that's where the toilet paper is, Anna said. And then she closed the door on me. As I sat there, I started to reach for the toilet paper. Within three seconds, I found it. After wiping, I stood up and twisted my body to throw the paper into the bowl. And then I reached out for the flush. But as I turned my body back, I suddenly felt dizzy and lost orientation. I couldn't feel the wall where I had expected it would be. I ended up stumbling loudly. Are you okay there? Anna called out. Yeah, I said. Luckily, my forehead found the door and I sorted myself back up. It was late afternoon when we left the restaurant. I felt overwhelmed seeing things through my sense of hearing, smell, taste, and touch. I experienced what would have been familiar things in a whole new way. 
I started getting lost in my thoughts, reliving the events of the day in my head that I didn't notice my voice recorder slipping out of my pocket in our cab ride back to our lodging. I still have three small tapes with me, containing the earlier parts of our day and the first part of my interview with Raquel. I just don't have a player to be able to listen to it. I imagine it would be like hearing a ghost from the past. I've written letters about this trip to different people, because the story never made it in print. Our editor said the magazine was shutting down before I even finished writing the article. I also never received copies of the pictures for Mark. So, it's perfectly reasonable to think that I made this all up. Some part of me wishes I did, because then the story would sound like it has melody. It would sound like a complete tune with a beginning, a middle, and an end. But I see now, telling the truth will always leave something still to be said, to be developed, like a melodic seed that has yet to develop into a big symphonic tree. I wish I had been able to give those people the printed review they deserved. I thought I'd write this down in my diary instead.